Hi, I'm Paul Schaefer. I'm Will Lee. And you are watching, watching the Letterman, Letterman Podcast. Podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome once again to the Letterman Podcast. My name is Mike Chisholm. All right. We're not burying the lead. We got Bill Carter back. And uh, I'm going to tell you straight up, first off, the audio wasn't perfect on it. Okay. There were parts where some things uh, uh, didn't. The, the connection on one of our ends was was a little um, was a little hinky, as Dave would say, but that's OK, because we had an unbelievable conversation. It is worth getting it out there. The vast majority of it was great. Um, boy, is it cool to have uh, him on here for a second time, because the first time I got to get a lot of the fanboy stuff out of my system. There's still a little bit of that here because, you know, I'm just that enthusiastic about this stuff. But uh you know, to, to kind of get to the place where he, he and I can just kind of go back and forth on things. We talk about everything that's happening in late night right now uh, from, from Dave appearing on Colbert. We talk about Jon Stewart. We talk about after midnight, uh, the change that's just happened there, the state of late night, we go through that. And um, Bill is just, he is such a precious resource uh, for those of us who love this stuff. Um, and, and, and it's, it's so funny. I'm glad that this component exists where we can kind of get together and talk about this because that's the, that's the thing. You've got all these networks and all these stars and all these people that are involved, but then you've got the audience that made them who they are. And it's kind of this deal that we all have, but the audience needs to get together and talk about this stuff. Having Bill on here to shoot the bull about, uh, the state of late night is, it's an unbelievable privilege and he is just a fantastic mind. I appreciate him like crazy. So um, I hope you enjoy. Uh, now, now that being said, um, Bill has a couple projects that are coming out uh, that he's going to be announcing in the next couple of weeks here. So, uh, but that being said, The Late Shift and The War for Late Night, these are books that need to be, uh, you know, downloaded. If, you, if, you're a, if you're a digital person, go find a hard copy of it if you like the classic. Fantastic reference materials written like uh, a thriller. And I, I mean, I can't, I can't emphasize that enough. The late shift obviously centering around uh, the Dave and Jay, a uh, little dust up from back in the day. And then, um, and then Conan and all of that stuff. And then the war for late night uh, talking about um, Conan's, uh, you know, late shift two, I call it all the time. You know, that's when Conan, um, you know, uh, got and, 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 and lost the tonight show uh, and the aftermath of that, but then also talking about all the other players that have risen up or were, were rising up in that time, uh, including Kimmel and John Stewart and Stephen Colbert and, 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 and Ferguson as well. And, and all of these other people, we talk about John Stewart coming back to the daily show. Now these books in so many ways are actually more relevant today, uh, as, as, as history periodicals. Um, than they were back in the day talking about current events. Bill Carter, an absolute gem of a guy. We have a fantastic conversation despite a little bit of audio issues. Fight your way through it, folks. It's worth it. The Letterman Podcast is proud to present Bill freaking Carter. Bill, it was such a kick to have you on the first time. Um, the only thing that's better about this is that you came back. I can't believe it. You're back on the Letterman Podcast. Bill Carter, um, an absolute, maybe, maybe the, um, uh, foremost mind when it comes to everything in the inner workings of late night, uh, and its history, uh, two-time author, uh, you know, uh, on, on the subject itself with, uh, the late shift and the war for late night, go and get them. Everybody should go and get them and read them multiple times as I have. Thank you so much for coming back on the Letterman podcast, my friend. It's amazing. I still have something to say on this subject. <laughs> it's 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 tireless but, it's but i'll give it a go <laughs> <laughs> but we do um this is one of those things where 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 us uh i mean i don't know if we call us comedy nerds or late night nerds or whatever it is that we are but but this is something that is endlessly fascinating i think the landscape is changing we have certainly seen that uh you know yes. recently another election cycle coming up that always um changes things and, and and reinvigorates and reignites the late night scene when that happens and uh it's gotten particularly intensified over the last few cycles of this. Um, I wanted to start by talking about, I haven't, I've actually really, I haven't released this video. I've, I've made a video about it, but I haven't released it yet. And we haven't really gone deep on Dave coming back on Colbert. Um, I, that was a, that was a major event 
I think, uh, you know, in front of the camera and behind the camera. There's a yeah. lot of moving parts to that. Um, I am so curious as to um, what your reaction was to Dave uh, coming back to the Ed Sullivan Theater for the first time since he left it back in 2015. Um, what was your what was your thought on that? Well, I, I thought it was exceptionally good. I mean, I thought it was really a great hit that he did on the show. I mean, he's a great guest, Dave. He, he's always a great guest. And he prepares and he's funny and he's sharp and all that. But the fact that he was back in the, on the stage, you know, Tell, told me something because he wanted to uh, push that away. He, he really did want to keep that in the past, in the rearview mirror, so to speak. And the fact that he did it, I thought he's kind of loosening up. You know what I mean? I think he's kind of loosening up about his legacy and things like that, that, you know, he never really wanted to talk about. He never really, you know, he's always diminishing that, you know, like, oh, the dog and pony show and all that. But in his gut, he sort of is incredibly proud of it. And I, I think, you know, he's he's getting warmer to it, you know, with with Barbara Gaines as well and, and things like that. So I was very encouraged to see it. And I thought Colbert was tickled as heck. I mean, he really was. And you kind of see this this reverence that that people have for Dave, the late night world has for Dave, which, you know, it's only comparable to Carson. I mean, there's no one else has it. Although maybe John Stewart is kind of around the fringes now, though. So, you know, we talk about legacy in 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 late night, and and it's so interesting having the track record that we have, uh, and 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 that that long view of history, and how we are at the place now where we're. You know, I think I think it's safe to say that a lot of Gen Xers have always said David Letterman is my Johnny Carson, and that was in comparison to watching our mothers and our fathers watching Carson compared to our feelings for him. And I think that that sentiment's been around forever. And you'll hear people say that to Dave all the time, much to his chagrin. But now we're actually seeing a time right. where he is the elder statesman um, in in this. And, and the comparison to Johnny Carson is getting much closer. The major difference being, uh, you know, uh, when Senator Franken was on one of the very last late shows, it was in the last month, I believe, um, he, he, uh, you know, did a <laughs> famously predicted that Dave would become an eccentric recluse. And, and of course that's a comparison <laughs> yeah. to Carson, but Dave kind of went the right. exact other way. And, 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 and with my next guest and, and some of these other, uh, projects that he has done, um, even the Netflix comedy festival. I mean, I got, I got tickets. It's happening in May. Um, he's going to be doing, uh, the last time he did the, the show with the young up and coming comics, including uh, Brian Simpson, who's bit huge in the comedy world now, and he's going back to uh, I think they're calling it the Giants of of of, of comedy. Dave's Dave is really out there for a seventy six year old guy who has nothing left to prove. Um, he's out there a lot, isn't he? Yeah, that that is sort of what I, what's remarkable to me because I would have tended toward the reckless prediction myself uh, because he, socially Dave has always been not comfortable. Uh, you know, in, in social situations, but he's very comfortable as a performer and that performer made him come alive. You know what I mean? He, as he, as he said, you know, I'm, I never feel anything more alive than that one hour a day I'm, I'm on the, on the stage. And I think he probably misses that, you know, um, Carson missed it too, but he didn't do anything <laughs> instead of Carson doing anything. He wrote jokes for Dave, you know, <laughs> that was, that was sort of how he got his, you know, comedy muscles working. And I think Dave wants to stay fit that way. You know, I think it's important to him to still have that working, his brain working that way. And I, I do think it's enjoyable for him. And I, I don't, I can't speak to it, but I imagine he enjoyed that Colbert performance a lot. I, I, I think he probably thought it was invigorating, you know? Well, um, you know, I've had a few folks that are kind of close to the situation that have reached out and and apparently, you know, Grand Slam home run on on everybody's, uh, as far as everybody is concerned. Uh, the, the thing about Colbert, and I mean, we can go back to Strike Force 5 too. I'm, I assume that you listened to all the Strike Force 5 episodes. Not all um, of them, but I did listen, yes. <laughs> they were incredible. <laughs> incredible. Um, of course, the ones where, where, where uh, Dave, and then we'll talk about John oh, Stewart in a minute. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I think that's probably the other thing that he does. Uh, you think about all the appearances he's making. Um, he was on Neil Brennan's podcast. Unbelievable, uh, unbelievable episode. I mean, Neil Brennan asked a lot of the questions 
um, that I think folks who love your work uh, would have asked. You know, he he really um, went into some of this stuff. But 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 him appearing on Strike Force Five, him appearing in these some of these uh, Kevin Hart's uh, podcast he appeared on, and then and then Colbert um, asking the question to Dave on Strike Force Five. You know, would you be willing to come back to the Ed Sullivan Theater and actually like? literally hit the question head on. You got to wonder behind the scenes if, 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 you know, there was permission for him to ask that question or not. Um, I, I talked to Colbert when I went out to um, Rupert's retirement party uh, the night before I, I actually had a Q and a session with Steven. And that was the question I asked him. I said, listen, when you asked Dave to come back on the show and when you recounted your Les Moonves story, did were you scared doing that? And he said, absolutely, he was. And it felt like he was. If you listen to it, there's hesitation <laughs> in the voice. Yep. You know, absolutely. Um, and the way they devoted the entire show to Dave, including who do you want on as the musical guest, which is something that uh, you'll remember back in Late Show. I mean, Sheila and Paul and so many of the of the staff cared about Dave's musical taste. I thought it was just an absolute masterpiece. Uh, you know, every segment today, no, meanwhile, there was a monologue and then we bring on Dave for every segment up to yeah. the national. It felt big time. It felt like a, a, it felt like a big moment in a world where big show uh, television moments don't exist so much anymore. It's a, it, that's a really good point. They don't exist like that anymore. And, but for those guys, Letterman, Letterman has always occupied this special space for comedians. He did something that, they all admire. They just think, you know, he just changed the rules so much and and opened things up so much that they they they're sort of in awe of him, you know. And and that's why they're a little afraid. <laughs> like even Colbert, who you know, I I think you know can stand up in front of George Bush and make fun of him, you know, at a pres at an event. Yeah. It, he he was a little trepidatious because if you go there with that Dave, you know, you tiptoe around him a little bit, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think that reverence is extraordinary. You don't, you know, comics tend to rag on each other. Do you know what I mean? They do. Mm -hmm. They t and and you, you heard that in that podcast. They, you know, they picked on Fallon mercilessly, <laughs> but yeah, but, you know, but affectionately, I think. But oh, I mean, sure. Dave, Dave, you don't do that with Dave. They don't. You don't. You don't hear them doing that with Dave. And and he just somehow broke through. In a way, I don't know if anybody will ever do that again. I mean, we'll change the sort of the form form of comedy that significantly. Yeah, I I, I could not agree more with that. Um, to pivot just a little bit, and and I would love to know your insights a little bit. John Stewart making the big announcement that uh, he's going to be coming back to the Daily Show for Mondays. By the way, huge shout out to our friend Madeline Smithberg. We're thinking of her right now. Love her so 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 much. Uh, as we as we talk about John, um, fantastic, isn't yeah. she amazing? She's just unbelievable. I adore her. I adore her mind, her brilliance, and yes. uh, her wit as well. And um, yes, I love Madeline. And uh, she has and she, some she, best she, stories you you'll ever hear. <laughs> yes. I know it. <laughs> I know it. And I'm trying very hard to uh, to actually get her to come on camera and tell some of those stories. Um, you did. For yep. the story of late night, still comfort food for me. Uh, I, I, I've got it on the DVR and I still watch them from time to time. And the podcast behind the desk, Webby award winning podcast, Mr. Carter. Yes, uh, hey, that's right. <laughs> um, highly recommend that. She's actually in that. I think there's more clips of her in the podcast than there are. Um, Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. You got yes. to expand I, a little bit. Was after we did the after we did the documentary, some of the stories didn't get in. And I was like, I got to get I got to get Madeline tell the story about the sheep herding dogs. And I mean, I, and the it, cologne. <laughs> and the cologne. Oh my God, the cologne. <laughs> you know, so, uh, <laughs> yeah. So Madeline is fantastic. Anyway. Yeah. All the best to Madeline. Absolutely. Uh, so let's go back to John Stewart here. I mean, you know, somebody who was associated with pants along the way, um, you, you know, his MTV show, Dave being a guest on that show. And, and um, <clears throat> you know, when Tom Snyder, and we'll get to him in a bit, uh, we had a, a fan request to talk a little bit about Tom Snyder with you. Um, you know, a lot of folks thought, okay, here's a guy that might look at doing Late Late Show, but then they went the other way. Uh, Craig Kilborn starts The Daily Show, 
and they do a little dose I do. You know, I think there was a holding deal with John Stewart with Worldwide Pants. Is that how it worked? And then John went over to the Daily Show. Yeah. So I haven't looked at this in a while, but basically, uh, uh, they they made a deal with John, uh, and I think John was set up and believed he was going to get the twelve thirty show. Um, and this, you know, I think people felt like Dave decided no. <laughs> uh, and you know, there are theories that Dave was like, uh, that guy's really good on a young comic and I don't need that on the air after me, <laughs> which I wouldn't be surprised if I've never, he's never expressed that to me, but, uh, um, I think John was a little disappointed that that didn't happen. Uh, but it opened up the, the daily show to him. So, you know, that will end up being a great, great move for John. And he, and he proved why he was going to break through somewhere because he, he is really dynamic. And uh, I, as I was saying, except for Dave, he changed late night the most, I think, um, because he really brought that format and that point of view and just the approach uh, that was really fresh and, and different and became, you know, sort of like the defining... You know, Dave was sort of the defining watch for a generation. And for John, it was that way. And people in the next generation watched The Daily Show to actually get the news. Yep. They they thought, well, I don't know what the rest of the BS is going on, but but this guy will tell me what's going on. That was extraordinary, really. So to me, it's pretty exciting that he's going to come back and do this. Yeah, you know, uh, uh, the legacy being Carson um, famously um, you know, kind of right down the middle, make fun of everybody, but kind of lightly compared to the climate that we see now. Yeah. Um, you know, you had a guy like Dick Cavett come, who's a friend of the show as well. Uh, hi, Dick. Um, you know, come on. And 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 he kind of counter-programmed Carson in that regard. But really, at the end of the day, not a lot of uh, folks in the late night uh, comedy realm, um, you know, would do that. Dave kind of stayed the same way, you know, was, was, was very much uh, that of, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a registered independent, you know, was very clear about yeah. that along the way. He made this amazing legacy that people are following. Changed comedy forever. Who's the next guy that did it? You're exactly right. John Stewart. John Stewart's the guy who kicked the door wide open down Cabot's path and said, let's, let's, let's criticize. Let's look at some of the uh, ridiculousness mm -hmm. that's going on and let's make it part of the, of the, the, the main conversation in our late night comedy. And now look at the people who have emulated him, and 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 you know Colbert was a spinoff to that in 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 that uh, um, in that regard. So yeah, the two Absolutely. very so he was and he was already and he started as a correspondent on the show. So you know yeah. that that link is is pretty obvious. But uh, yeah, I think he but John John made <clears throat> made it safe to have a point of view. Yes, I think is what you he, he made it safe to have a point of view. Uh, and you and now if you don't, there's something like you know Fallon got into trouble because he, he tried to not have a point of view, you know, <laughs> and that yeah. hurt him initially. And yeah. I think his jokes now are, are more pointed, maybe not as much Kim or Colbert, but you know they are. Uh, so yeah, I think that's that's a big legacy of John Stewart. Definitely. What do you think about him coming back to uh, to like? I, I, obviously, you're going to watch anyway, but. Is is every Monday night? Are you going to be watching this thing starting February? Is this must see TV for you? Go, there gonna, we go. It's absolutely must see when John yep. comes back. I'm a little intrigued what he's going to do in terms of um, just whether he's going to be the same or whether he's going to try something a little different. I, I, I'm intrigued by that. Um, I think you know you have to speculate that John, in his you know, had in his career was like, I, all right, I've done what, what I had to do with The Daily Show. And he left The Daily Show thinking that he was going to move to another phase of his career, which has not really developed. I mean, he didn't really put something on the map like that, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, but his timing was curious because he left just as the Trump phenomenon was beginning in yes. politics, just as it was beginning. And he and he and Trump have a vicious hostility that goes back, way back. And you know, he, you know, Trump makes these overtly anti-Semitic references to, to Stewart. You know, you're really John Leibowitz, right? And you're running away from your heritage. Really vicious stuff. 
And, you know, he calls him fuckface von Clowns. It's way under Trump's skin. So there's something there. So, you know, that's going to be part of this. But I yep. also think John is like, he didn't get his licks in on Trump. He really didn't. Nope. And now when it's coming back again, I think it's like, uh, you know, I, I compare it to, I mean, you know, John's like a prize fighter who stepped away. And there's some guy that, you know, needs to be stopped. <laughs> so he's, you know, he, he's decided to put the gloves back on. Uh, that's kind of my sense. I haven't talked to him about it. And he would def he would deflect. He would never say that because John always talks about, you know, I'm not really a political guy. I'm really just a comedian, yeah. uh, et cetera. And, and, and really, that has not played out because his his positions now are much firmer and out there. But um, that is very exciting to me. I'm, I'm really excited about how he's going to do it now. He's going to do it once a week. So it's almost like a Saturday Night Live. It's yeah. Really, you know what I mean? It's not a nightly show. It's a little it's going to be a little different that way. And uh, and will the guests be overtly political people? Uh, you know, that's sort of also interesting. He would obviously occasionally have those people. Mm -hmm. But uh, he he's he, he's a very thoughtful guy, John. Very thoughtful. I'm looking forward to it. Oh, very much so. Um, you know, you compared to Saturday Night Live. I think about John Oliver and what he has done. I, 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 the idea that he will have a week to invigorate his next episode. Um, yeah, I feel like there's going to be a lot of depth there, and 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 you know, I, I could see it being both. I could still see John being that guy who has no problem picking on both sides, and I don't, I don't want to make this anything. I, you know, this podcast is neutral ground. We're very, very, very much neutral ground. I think part of it's the fact that I'm Canadian. Uh, I don't want, I don't want to create division and polarization and all of that stuff. I do note though, when the last, I believe it's the last time John appeared on Colbert. It might be the second last time he comes on and he starts talking about the lab leak and, and, and Colbert, you know, kind of the moment it happens, Colbert kind of gets up and starts sort of almost uh, stopping John talking about these, this thing. Right. And I don't think the one thing I do love about John is he is willing to, if there's a stone that needs to be thrown, uh, the target does not matter, uh, you know, whichever side he's on. And that's one thing I love about John, but yeah, I mean, obviously, um, you know, with this election cycle, both he and Letterman, both they, they, they left right as the Trump machine was going. And, and so many people have asked the question, what would it be like yeah. if Dave, if Dave got a chance every <laughs> single night to yeah. make fun of, of Trump, I think he would have fatigued personally. That's my, that's my, uh, uh, my opinion on it. Uh, it's a big difference between George W. Bush and great moments in presidential history um, than there was with 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 Donald Trump and the true real polarization that he kind of created. That's my theory on that. But it's going to yeah. be very interesting to see uh, John with that with that pulpit and and what he's going to be able to do with it. Here's something that's worth observing, though, because yes, sir. John knows his audience is going to be anti-Trump. He's he knows that and. He still went. I remember he he would occasionally criticize Obama, yep. and uh, and the audience would like kind of like be uncomfortable. And he would yeah. say to them, "No, you got to listen to this." He would like he he would point that out. He would say, "No, you got to listen." Now he's going to go after Biden for for things. I guarantee it. Yep. I guarantee it. I mean, they but like, to be fair, the other guys, the theme of Biden being an old guy is established, and that anything that comes up in that realm is going to be fodder. For yes. sure. You know, Trump is doing the same thing or worse in, in, in what he's saying. You know, you're like, what is he talking about? Like sometimes, but it, it, that is a vulnerability. And yeah, I would not be surprised at all if, if uh, Stewart is on the, is in the position of, well, you know, why do we have both these guys? You know, what, what's, what's stuck with both these guys? I would not be surprised at all about that. And John has always been particularly focused on the media's role and how the media portrays this and how they're 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 not be, they're not serious enough and they're not you know and they're too frivolous about it and i think we'll see a lot of that but the thing i also intrigued but remember what the daily show was really great on when and john was there was their research staff was fantastic yes. and if some politician came out and said something he would find the opposite they had said and expose the heck out of them you yep. know and i think that is going to be very interesting how he handles it but the show was really a serious journalistic show in a lot of ways and when i say to john i had a stage event with john once and i said john why can you why do you run from the idea that you're actually sort of a journalist as well as a, 
I'm not. I'm not that. I absolutely reject that. I'm not that. I'm a comic. That's what I am. I'm a comic. Yep. Well, I mean, he, I, I don't think anybody thinks he's at, at. He is the equivalent of a political cartoonist. That's what he's. That's what he's. He, he is doing that. That's what he's doing, and it's definitely something you that could be legitimately in any form of professional journalism. And I think he has done a lot of things that are journalistic. So um, I, I think we'll see even more of that when he has a week to work on things. Oh, this is why, this is why you are the, the, the what, what a comparison. This is a, what an amazing comparison. You think about this generation now uh, where memes are, are, are a huge part of, 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 of communication, whether it's comedy, whether it's making points or whatever, that generation probably doesn't understand or have the reverence that they should for old school political cartoons. You think about political cartoons back in the day as to what yeah. they are and the power of them, uh, the influence yeah. of them. And and that is a really, really great comparison. He's like a living uh, a political cartoonist. And and, and yeah. yeah, that 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 is a perfect, perfect analogy. Uh, it's going to be great to have him back to see what happens. It's going to be great to see if, 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 if he is given free reign. I assume... For him to come back and do this, I assume he's going to get it. He's kind of got that kind of almost Letterman-ish clout where if he's going to come back, I assume it's going to be on his terms. Well, well, not just that. I mean, he's going to be the executive producer of the show in Toto. So I think his fingerprints are going to be all over it. I find it curious they didn't name a host. They didn't know John was going to do this. I think they would. They were ready to to put Hassan, and, Hassan Minaj in the job. Okay. I think they would have done that. Yeah. But but I also think not naming host or having a permanent host is a bad idea. It's a bad idea because you know I think some of the people they've had as guests are, are good. They're 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 pretty good. But you watch these shows and you get affinity with the personality. Yes, and, you know, and and he was talking about being a guest on shows like this. He, he said, in, in our world, we don't say I'm going on late night i'm going on the tonight show no i'm doing dave i'm doing jay i'm that's that's what you're doing cool there you, yep you have absolutely association with the host so this this permanent you know one night a week or one week at a time thing was not a great idea for that show now i don't know what this means i mean what happens if john really likes doing it again I mean, one of the reasons he stopped was his kids were little and he really wanted to participate in in, in you know, the childhood of his kids. Yep. He was once with him at, uh, when he was doing the, the Oscars, I, I was interviewing him like a couple of nights before the Oscars. He was in LA and he had yep. to stop the interview. So it's bedtime. I got to read stories to my kids. And I was like, this guy is very involved. So I believe that totally, but his kids are older now. And, yep. you know, he, if he wants to go back to this, he maybe could do it. And, and they couldn't find anybody better. I mean, he's 61. Well, Dave is 61. He had much time left. You know? Absolutely. Plenty of time left. So it's not impossible. I just think the idea of doing it, maybe it's a bit of a grind. But, you know, I think every one of these guys has found virtually everyone. I can't. I'm trying to think if there's an exception has found that there is no job after this that is comparable. There is yep. nothing you can do that is comparable to this. And if you if you're one of the established giants of this you know i mean dave clearly has been in the fringes of because that was who he was that's what he was you know he's not going to do something else so i mean you know i you know i've talked to kimmel i'm very close to kimmel yeah and he says you know we all hate this job but we'll never ever give it up like you know it's like <laughs> <laughs> and i think that's true of all this so it, it's it's such it's a very fascinating time, Mike. Yeah, I agree. And to springboard to Kimmel for a second here, um, I was going to talk about him a little bit later, but this is a good way to uh, to go back. Um, I'm going to do it through a segue of Robert Morton, though. Uh, when Morty was on the show, uh, he always gives you shout outs, by the way. He uh, he appreciates you very, very much. He told me he told he told a couple stories, uh, one about a party. Uh, where he drunkenly came up to you after an Arsidio Hall, you you gave a, 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 a favorable comment about Arsidio Hall, and he came up to you and gave you hell and had to apologize after. <laughs> I appreciated him for telling the story. Um, but one of the things that he said on the show, and we'll get back to Kimmel in a second here with this, uh, that I hadn't heard before, and I mean, I've read Late Shift so many times, 
he had said that there was a deal in place early on in late show to have Rosie O'Donnell on as the permanent guest host for late show. And I don't know that I had known that before. And then, and then at yeah. some point, uh, someone had gotten back into, into either Dave's ear or they, they, the decision was made. Well, no, you don't give up the chair, uh, especially this early in the run, whatever you don't give up the chair, that kind of a thing. Kimmel's gone the other way. And 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 has yeah. all sorts of guest hosts, which I find absolutely delightful. It's one of the few throwbacks to Carson um, that I think exists in modern late night today. The idea of the guest host, he's basically the only one doing yeah. it. Um, the Rosie O'Donnell thing, that wasn't in Late Shift, was it? No, I don't think so. I remember it vaguely uh, because one of the things that was sort of clear was that, that you know, Carson was able to do that. Carson didn't do that when he started. No. He was able to do that when he became the king of late night. Yes. Right? So yes. you could have a, a guest on, on Joan or Monday. And no one would think, oh, this person's... And at some point with Dave, it would never have happened. It would never have happened with Dave. No. But at the beginning, Dave obviously wasn't secure like he became later. I think that was a that was a risk. You know, and you know, eventually they went to that format of taping two shows in a day. Yeah. So he can, he can have an extra day off. Yeah. Uh, but but I think nobody but Carson was secure enough to do that. Jimmy's in an interesting position. He he takes the whole summer off. Yeah. He takes. Yeah. He, he basically says, "I I need this. I I need I need a real vacation. I'm taking the summer off. I have little kids. I'm gonna." Yep. And you know that that could be risky, I guess. I think it's not the same because I, I can't imagine someone would come on and would be like, he's on for a week and he doubles Kimmel's ratings. I just don't want that. That's not going to happen. That's so, a Larry uh, Sanders bit. Yeah, that's yeah, exactly. I mean, <laughs> you know, that, that whole thing, Larry, that was a, it's very interesting to mention Larry Sanders because when, when they first were doing uh, the, the substitute host, it was supposed to be Gary and Jay Leno. We're going to go out of that. And that's how Jay got to do it every week. Isn't that funny how, uh, you know, these things, life imitates arts and some of the, some of these things that are there. But I love the fact that, that, that uh, Kimmel does it. I think it does show how secure he is in that gig. Uh, 21 years. I mean, you know, I, I love, you did a, you did a really good job in the war of late night uh, going through uh, the war for late night, I should say, uh, going through, Kimmel's ascension and where he he came from. I love this guy right from the start. We we had a we have a comedy channel in Canada which isn't Comedy Central, uh, but it has some of the some of the stuff that goes on there. So I watched uh, Man Show, but Win Ben Stein's Money. I loved him yeah. on Win Ben Stein's Money, and and it showed he had um you know that reactionary uh, wit similar yeah. to Letterman. You can tell he was an acolyte of Dave for sure with with that uh, that exercise. Um, and 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 he really has paid his dues. <laughs> yeah. Twenty one years. I don't know if anybody would have called that at the beginning of this thing with him when he was following Nightline and all of that. They really gave him time, like Conan, original Conan, not uh, Tonight Show yeah. Conan. They gave him time to actually incubate and to uh, and and to become something. And he really has. Like yeah. Like he's kind of the elder statesman in some ways right now. It's interesting. He is. He's the longest running host, but. It's interesting because I was there the week when he premiered. I was doing a magazine piece for the New York Times. I spent a week with him. That's how I really got to know him. And he was, of course, so into the relationship because he was a fan of Dave and he wanted to drain my brain of all that. Oh, yeah. But we hit it off. And I, and I thought, this guy has what, it appear, what, what really makes these things work, which is, yes, you're witty and all that. But he connects. He connects, you know, like, and it was very likable and, you know, he was extremely nervous and uptight. Of course he was. And, you know, he had, he did things that were, I don't know if I ever told you this story, but he, you know, when he first did the show, he wanted to do the monologue sitting down. Yep. Which, you know, it's really not, you don't break the format very easily. Yeah, let's nope. put it, And he didn't have a, 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 a open neck shirt with a the white t-shirt showing. And I thought it doesn't look right. It doesn't look right. But, um, <laughs> But he finally decided that he would do the, uh, the, the stand-up. He, ABC executives talked to him. There was all kinds of stuff going on in the background. But when he first did, <laughs> the first night I think he did, it's standing up. 
And he, throughout the monologue, he did this. And I, I immediately sent him an email. I said, listen, <laughs> you're going to make the audience sick. They're going to get seasick. <laughs> seasick, yeah. <laughs> you're not, you can't rock like that. And he, he stopped after one night. He stopped after one night. And, you know, and so the point was, he wasn't so one of these guys locked in. I know what I'm doing. I'm a, he was listening. And he, he, there was an ABC executive who said, you know, you're not standing up. She said, when, if someone comes to your door, would you go greet them or would you sit, sit at the couch yep. and wait for them to come in? No, you stand up and you go greet them. That's part of the reason you do that. You're standing up and you're greeting people. And he said, well, that makes sense. Okay, that makes sense. And a lot of that, it, it's funny. I did a, I did one of the segments of the podcast on the format. Yep. Why the format is what it is. Yep. It's very hard to change the format. Seth Meyers is doing it behind the desk. Yep. Because he was a, he was the weekend update anchor, and he was comfortable doing that. He also doesn't wear a suit and tie, which I find interesting. But partly it's because I think it gives Seth a little bit of a of a difference, and uh, and and <clears throat> I do think it works for him. So. It does, uh, you know, and it, it's cool that some of these hosts have had given, uh, been given sort of latitude to find themselves. Craig Ferguson, another one, stopped wearing the tie for a while and all that. And and, and under the expert uh, guise of, of of Peter LaSalle, Peter would give him some of that latitude to try and change things up a little bit and come back to it. Um, Seth being a great example of that. Yeah, and, and I can't endorse uh, your podcast enough. Uh, Behind the Desk, the story of late night. It's, it's uh, you know, search it out. There is an episode that talks uh, all about this going back to Johnny, or to Steve Allen, I should say, with the desk yeah. and, and where that came from, why it's so powerful. Um, you know, you even look at, uh, at at times where they tried to monkey with it. Uh, you know, wouldn't it be funny if part of the reason the Jay Leno show didn't work because they weren't allowed to have a desk um, that at the 10 o'clock show? I mean, it's it's awkward when you see them not in that situation. Hey, and yeah, yeah. It, it is. There's just something about it that's um, that's awkward. Uh, let's speaking of taking the desk away, um, you know, we, we just had Annie Snyder on uh, 29th anniversary of Late Late Show's Inception just happened and uh, talking about Tom. Um, for James, when James Corden, uh, you know, left, there, you know, long break in between because there was a huge strike and all of that sort of stuff. And it didn't kind of get the start that it was uh, it was intended. But after midnight with Taylor Tomlinson is here. And I'm super, super curious, um, you know, we're at the time of this recording, I think we're about two weeks into it, uh, two or three weeks into it. Uh, I'm curious what your thoughts are on After Midnight so far. Well, I've only seen it a few times. I haven't mm -hmm. watched it routinely. Um, and one of the reasons is I've had my own history with this is don't make too many judgments early on these shows. Absolutely. You got, you've just got to give it time. You, Absolutely. You, you know, if a person is good at it, they're going to find it. They're going yep. to find something. Uh, she is a well-regarded comic now. I mean, she's got she's doing big, big shows, big arena type shows. Um, so she has that, you know, in her golf bag, that club mm -hmm. in her bag that she can do that. Uh, I think the format is tough. I think it's a tough format because um, essentially uh, there's a joke every. 30 seconds or something. Yeah. Right. Uh, joke, 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 joke. And I know from watching back in the day when Jay would do 25, 30 jokes in his monologue. And I used to say to him, why do you do that many jokes? Oh, I think the audience like, I said, but you know, some of them stink. Yeah. You know, they do that. You know, if you have 25 jokes and seven or eight of them are really good, right? You could do a 10 joke monologue and people say, wow, that was a great monologue. But if you if those seven or eight are in among 18 not good ones, you lose the impact of the good ones. Yeah. So uh, that to me makes format extremely difficult. And it doesn't look organic because, you know, these comics aren't you know, <laughs> some of it is witty, but I mean, so I think that is a little tough. Now, in the previous iteration of this show. Yes. When they when they did uh, uh, af at midnight, I guess it was yep. called, right? It was yep. called at midnight. Um, I think it improved as it went along. I think it improved as it went along. <clears throat> and I think they'll find that they have to do something a little more organic 
so, so it doesn't feel so rote. You're like, and now you tell a joke, and now you tell a joke, and now you tell a joke. And I'll give you the points. I'll give you the points. So I can give you. It's a little too rote for me. Yeah. Uh, it needs to be more organic. I think she needs to have more of her. Um, you know, and the comic mix is also tough to pull off. I mean, you, they they seem to have like one kind of known comic and two unknown comics. Yes. It kind of is how they're working it. And uh, and that's also interesting and challenging because, you know, when you would see a comic on with Carson or, or, or Dave or something, a lot of them were unknown comics. And for that reason, they were on at the end of the show. Sure. <laughs> they were on. They came yes. on at the end. And and if somebody hit, they they would immediately get some attention. But so it's a tough format. And and I um but I'm patient. I, I'm like, okay, she's a talent they want they're committed to. Let's see what happens. I think it's again, you tinker with late night format, it's hard to pull off. It's yeah. just hard to pull off. And I understand why you do it. It's a much less expensive show. And, you know, they can't do another, I guess they can't do another high budget idea of a show. Um, I think they they rolled the dice on Corden and, and they came up big. I think the guy's really talented. Absolutely. The guy is really, really talented. And he brought some interesting stuff to the late night. No doubt about it. No doubt yeah. about it. Um. But I guess they they didn't want to do that with her. I mean, it'd be interesting to me format what it would look like, um, because I I'm always thinking that the somewhere there's a a female host that will actually really explode in late night. It, it, it seems bizarre that you know Samantha B had a show for a while and then yeah. they, that didn't last. And you know, I mean, it's not like there isn't. Oh, I mean, if they gave a show to Tina Fey, I think it'd be great. Yeah, I, I just think it'd be great. She'd be great. Yep. Uh, so it's not because it's a woman. It's it's a lot of other factors. I uh, I think I think you bring up a lot of very very cool points here. Um, the uh, Taylor I think is great. I think she's got that. You know, when you think about you know uh, Jimmy hosting Win Ben Stein's money, that that intangible of what what is the contestant going to say or whatever, and what can I come back with? I think that there's enough scripted stuff for her, but she's also got that uh, that wit where yeah. she yeah, yeah she's got it i think i think she's got that factor uh it's funny it feels a little bit like i think about my uh, i think about my, my my millennial kids um you know and and uh, you know my, my youngest uh how he he's 25 now but how much he loved tosh uh and 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 there's a little feel of that in there you know you've yeah, got these the, yeah. inter the internet videos that everyone does watch we watch them at work you talk about water cooler moments how many times are water cooler moments somebody showing somebody else the telephone um, yeah. and, and a video on it. So you're adding that to it. Um, the part that you brought up that I thought was really interesting, um, because you also bring it up behind the desk, uh, and, 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 um, you know, I, I think about the only, the only Carson bump that exists now or, or Letterman bump, uh, you know, to a lesser extent a little bit, but certainly was there. Um, you know, when you had these new comics on, okay, they had new comics, but, they were extremely curated, <laughs> like like Jim yeah. McCauley and and Eddie Brill. Like I mean, Eddie Brill's friend of the show. We've had Eddie on a couple of times. He's a friend, and 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 you know, talking about how he would help hone these comics act. You know, the hunk that they would bring on that show was so curated, and and um, you know, now this world of of, of where you have these uh, you know yep. the, the Matt Rifes or these Ian Bags sure. of the world who are just razor sharp wits. They're the perfect comedians for this show because they can think so well on their feet. Uh, yeah. But that being said, Joe Rogan now can break a comic. He can, he can have a comic on his show and that is it. That comic has that Carson bump. I don't know if there's anybody else who can do it, but one of the things that you have pointed out is that many of these late night hosts now don't have the same impact on a comedian that they used to this show might actually start gain some yardage in that because I think that they are going to, it's so it's a, such a hungry beast. It's an hour long show. It feels a little bit right now. Like it should be a half hour uh, exactly. in my opinion. Um, I, but it's also a hungry beast. If you want to feed that beast three comics nightly, five nights a week, 
there's going to be a lot of uh, comics that are uh, that are that are undiscovered that 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 could potentially get exposure and get a break here. By the way, is your son still doing it, and is he going to be on After yes, Midnight anytime is. soon? Yes, I, he hasn't he hasn't been booked. He's aware of it, and and he has worked with Taylor Tomlinson before. So let's get he, Dan O'Carter on the on on After he Midnight. Has, he has. Um, uh, it's interesting though because if it's not it doesn't feel like the comic is doing their act though. No. Nope. You know, it's it's different, you know, and, and I I could see a comic breaking through because they're just so appealing and sharp that they could do that. But you know, there are comics who you would think because of the way they do their act, they couldn't work in this format. No, you know, because they have to build to a joke and they have to, you know, have a you know a, a particular persona when yeah. they're performing, and that's that's that doesn't work. This is very joke intense. Yes. Very joke intent. This is a joke, and, and and it's just not. It's very hard to make them land. They're isolated. They're just an isolated joke. You know, and there are jokes that work that way. They're just great jokes. But boy, you, you can't really make them stand out so well in this form. Or any other comic got invited on the show, I'd be like, you know. I, I got to be ready for, and I got to come up with so much material, so much different material. They got, you know, what, what are the topics going to be, and have a, I think it's a, it's challenging, and it, it it it's inexpensive, I guess, in a way, but very demanding, very demanding, you know. And like I said, you might still watch the, you know, if if Taylor Swift is booked on Stephen Colbert, yep. everybody's going to watch, right? Yeah, everybody's going to watch. But this show doesn't have that. It, it you know, they're not. They're not going to have Jerry Seinfeld as one of the three. No. Right? They're not, not going to have that. They're going to have Whitney Cummings. You know, they're going to have a, a, a known comic who isn't like a monster star. Um, and she's not going to be in the format you see her in, which is walking the stage and doing bits. And, you know, it. I I am intrigued about the long-term prospect of it. I think they're going to really have a feeling out process. I also found it interesting, Mike, that they did not publicize this very much at all. No. Going into they did not. This was a very soft launch. They just tried to get around. Now, interestingly, they're going to give her a shot after the Super Bowl. Yeah. They, you know, Colbert will be on first, but and that you know maybe that night will have three name comics. I don't know, but. They, they really have to do a great show that night, I think. Yeah, uh, that to me feels like the Colbert influence. And that's the other part of this equation that, um, you, you, you know, you think about Dave's Dave's deal with CBS, um, you know, the ownership, that kind of a thing. Well, you know, obviously they're not giving the keys to the kingdom away that they, that they used to. It's a different environment. But at the same time, as Colbert has has gained his uh, his strength and his influence, clearly a huge piece of the next show is 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 him and 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 uh he's got latitude there the the super bowl thing feels like it's a colbert um you know you know okay we want this show to succeed no you're, you're gonna give us a shot on that no question it's, to me it's interesting that colbert is doing that that he is getting involved with another show don't underestimate the influence of james baby doll dixon absolutely yes <laughs> and, and and as well with john coming back uh, baby doll, who I know well. Uh, do you know him well? That's a guy I would love to have a conversation with, just so you know. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> no, James, and and he is a Damon Runyon character. He's a and the fact that he also can represent, you know, Colbert, Stuart, Kimmel. I mean, it's remarkable, it's, yeah. it's just remarkable. Um, and uh, and you know you, you hang around with him, and he's smoking, and he's got his, you know, thing in his ear. He's he's a, he's a wild character, and every year he sends me the most kind of outrageous Christmas card, which brags about how rich he is. <laughs> uh, I find him very entertaining, actually. So. He's a guy I would have on in this show in a second, just because of the. Okay, so let's. There's a. This is a great pivot point. Um, it's almost like you've done this before. I want to go to SNL for a second here, but you think about a guy like, 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 uh, like James, and there is a comparison to be made to Lauren Michaels in a in a certain 
way. I mean, it's not because he's a showrunner and he's changed comedy and all no. that sort of stuff, but the way that he has kind of corralled yeah, um, built- and, and become an influential person in late night, similarly to the way that Lauren is over at NBC right now, I think a comparison can be made between the two. Yeah, in that in his, in in corralling talent and putting shows together, etc. Uh, I don't think James would ever think he has a, a comedy mind, uh, you know, like one right. Michael Scott. Of course, uh, he he he's a, a classic manager. He's the very he's a classic manager. Yeah, the uh, orchestration, the orchestration start is what I'm thinking. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, I, I think it's going to be interesting. I mean, you know, it sounds to me like the deal that he made for Stewart gets them very involved again in, in the Daily Show. And um, if Jan, if Jan, John doesn't continue, I would not be surprised if some other client of James's winds up being the host uh, in some fashion. Um, but he's he's got a great eye for talent because when he spotted John, you know, when he was not a big name at all. And by the way, John has stuck with him. And then these other guys get involved with him and they are incredibly loyal to him. Yeah. I mean, he, he gets them jobs. And one of the weirder things that happened was that Stewart was supposed to get the ABC job before before he got the Dale show. He was going to get the job and ABC pivoted at the last minute to Kimmel. And, yep. and Dixon kept both those guys. That is really remarkable. That that's another interesting story. So he's like an old school big time pro wrestling manager, like Bobby Heenan. You're in the Heenan family. You're in the <laughs> you're in the yeah, Dixon but, family. Yeah, but, but they're all baby faces for yeah. James. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's talk about yeah. SNL a little bit. We're approaching SNL fifty. We just had uh, Wally Ferriston on, and 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 he's already uh, scared for SNL fifty. He's got PTSD from SNL forty. Um, my God, where I remember when I was in high school and the SNL 15 episode, uh, uh, you know, special was on the primetime SNL 15, we're getting to SNL 50. Um, my goodness, mind blowing. It's insane. Um, I, I, I was fortunate to attend both the 25th and the 40th, uh, events, uh, and the difference between the two was the mag the, the magnification of size yeah uh when when lord decided he would invite every previous host to be at the 40th right uh who was living obviously and and that night was a crazy night it was so packed and and it, it didn't even touch on what else was going on because all these other performers and stars who weren't at the actual event wound up performing at the after party including taylor swift by the way yeah um, and prince for prince. god's sake that video is online i highly recommend watching it by the way the prince performance is online you can find it yeah it, it was I, I i was in the crowd it was like everything stopped when he was i mean it was incredible he just walked to the stage it's, it's, i mean it was amazing anyway what does he do with 50? I mean, you know, what does he do? Then, of course, a bigger question for me is then what does he do? You know, does yeah. he does he actually step away? And I was dead certain that he was going to because he yeah. said repeatedly, I'll get to the 50th, I'll get to the 50th. He's not totally saying that anymore. No. Um, I think he's still leaning toward it. He'll be 80 I guess it would be 79 when the event that I, I, I've always said this people who watch the show and many times the show isn't very good. Okay. It just, there are shows that miss and that, and I always sure. noticed like usually the first one back isn't very good when they're yeah. all, and then the second one, they, they click again or something. It, it, there's a lot of, there are patterns to the show yeah. and people are like, you know, why did, why, what's the matter with them? They have all these writers and that shows if you were there and you watch them do that, you would not believe it's capable of doing this. A 90-minute live show in an old building where you're basically running the sets down a hallway before (laughs) you get into the studio in between during a commercial, it is wild. It is absolutely wild. And, you know, they rewrite the show in between the dress and 
that night is insane. And yep. you know, and Michaels is as calm as can be, calm as can be, because he's done it so many times. It'll get on the air. You know, he's like, we'll get it done. So you, he's he is very much an irreplaceable person. Yeah, somebody will replace him. But I remember a few years ago, I maybe mean, when this was first brought up to people to the obvious subjects, Tina, Seth, Seth Myers, yeah, yep. who might be the replacement. And like no, nobody can do it but him. Yeah. Nobody can do it with him. But NBC is going to do it. <laughs> There's no way they're walking away that really gets generates not just a pretty good ratings, but buzz like crazy. Yeah. More buzz than ever. I mean, it's being followed so closely. It's like amazing. So yeah, that's an institution. That's not gonna end. But I'm fascinated by it. And Lauren will make the call. I mean, it'll be his call. You know, he'll he'll still have involvement. And I thought it was interesting that Tina didn't kind of rule it out she used to kind of rule it out um and you could see if, if she did it it would be you know i think it would be really a, an, an interesting change of pace uh and she's unbelievably brilliant uh, a comic mind so i'd i'd be excited about that um it's one of those things where wouldn't it be kind of wouldn't it be kind of neat if it was it was uh tina and seth I, that, to me, and I don't know why that has harmony in my mind, but it just does. It'd be so charming if it was Tina and Seth who, you know, to to take over two people to take over that one job um, and then still have Lauren some. So I can't I can't see Lauren doing anything. I mean, you know, maybe he's the, you know, he, the he, he would be. involved. Yeah. You know, he's, he's the guy that takes the host but, out for lunch. He still would keep that privilege. But I have to say, I can't see two people doing it. It has to be I one. Somebody who makes the calls. Yeah. This is in, that's out. This is the front, that's not. This you gotta have somebody and it's okay. That's it, okay. That's it. <laughs> like very hard. And uh and you you can I think you know, I know there's a biography of, of Lauren coming out. Yep. Uh at some point. And uh I was interviewed for that and I'm fascinated by it because I think it's he he's you can say he's the most important producer in the history of television uh you know you, you, you can make that case and uh or does the job after him is filling crazy gigantic shoes so um i wouldn't i wouldn't envy anybody to task you know so so you know and it's going to be interesting to see as well like when you think about jimmy and seth and his role on that side of things as well like i mean you know tremendous he's not just a showrunner for for, for one of the most important comedy shows of all time He's also, um, you know, a kingmaker and 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 the the person who holds the keys of the castle to the NBC's the rest of NBC's late night lineup as well. And that's going to be interesting to see how that change of power happens. Uh, not unlike getting the Tonight Show back from Carson. And next month is the tenth anniversary of Fallon taking over the Tonight Show, and Seth taking his show. Um, that's been ten years, so that's just about to happen in late night. Yeah, it's you know it's funny there are there are um there's a lot of folks out there who have become apathetic uh, you know remembering whatever their glory days were uh, there's still folks who who you know reach out to me and 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 Carson is their glory days um, and then there are people who obviously a tremendous amount of people who follow this show that are you know the J uh, the J Dave was their glory days that kind of a thing but many times you kind of don't know that these moments exist if you decide to put your perspective in the past but. There's a lot of cool stuff going on right now, still, despite how the the industry is diluted and whatnot. These these are these are some people now who are seasoned. They're veterans in their own right, uh, have their place. Like you look at Seth Meyers and the career that he has had, um, and and it feels like in some ways he is just getting started, but he's also ascending yeah. into roles like this. It's it's still an exciting time um, for 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 late night. Has the third book become clear to you yet? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, still not there yet. No. Still percolating. Uh, I, I wanted to say though that uh, you know people are rightly uh, can comment that the audiences for these shows are greatly diminished. That's yep. true uh, as a live on the air television thing. Yes, they, they are obviously watched a lot, you know, on YouTube and elsewhere. But also, I think they're. <laughs> Their importance to whatever is left of a network has only grown despite their 
fact that the, the ratings are lower because it's on four or five nights a week. Yep. That person is becomes like the face of the network. He's a signature star of the network. Yep. And because it's live every day, it's new every day, there's new material every day, that sets it apart from the rest of whatever is on NBC, yep. but also the rest of whatever on streaming. Yep. It's it's new every day. It's yep. a new show every single day. And that really has value above what the actual linear rating is. And I know this for a fact, I have uh, a relative of sorts to, who is a, 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 in sales for NBC. And yep. they're like, we love selling late night. We love that. We love it. We, there's, it it's on every day. It's And and that's great. It's everything. You you can see the things that people still watch are basically live stuff. That's basically what yeah watched on linear TV. Yep, news, news, sports, and late night. Yep. <laughs> that's that's kind of it. So I still think it has that element of, of specialness. And weirdly, because of social media, etc., this seems like there's more talk about it yeah. than there used to be. You know, I mean. You'd get a magazine article about Dave every once in a while, but there wasn't somebody following it on a podcast. <laughs> I mean, and it was like that. It's 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 uh, it, it, it just the New York Times does a roundup of the late night monologues. You know, um, it's still very viable in that way, uh, and, and streaming can't do it. That's one. It, it can't do it. Yep. It doesn't work. No, nope. you can't stream a show like this. It's got to nope. be done day and date. Or it doesn't work. Yep. Um, you know, and you know that from when they put a repeat week on, you're like, you're not interested in the repeat week. You know, it's a, it, it, you got to have the person commenting on what's happening that day. And so I, I, I still have some optimism about it. And I still think it's worth following like you're doing. <laughs> I, uh, I, I could not tell you how uh, that, that gives me encouragement. I'm so encouraged by those words, like, because, because, you know, reading both your books and then looking at, you know, reading the tea leaves, it felt like, okay, there's a free fall. And the first time you were on the show, you know, I said to you, you know, we don't want the, the, the last book to be the destruction of late night or, you know, we don't want yeah. that to be the, you know, we've seen the rise and now we've seen the fall. It's cool to see that if there is a, for lack of a better term, sort of a, uh, a bottoming out, maybe, maybe it's a, it's, it's a realization as to what this now is, um, you know, you know, how much of it is going to get on the internet. Corden, again, you brought it up earlier. I got to mention it again. You think about Corden and his views on YouTube and the next day and, and some of these bits. And I think yeah. that's really, you know, finding that sweet spot of, yeah. of what bits will be, you know, clippable and then what parts are topical that you want to see. You want to see people weigh in on certain things when yeah. certain events happen um, and, and, and we've got a plethora of folks. I think you're right. I think it still could get more diverse. Let's get some women in there. Um, so we can hear their point of view at the end of the day, when a major event happens, um, again, yeah, Tina Fey probably is probably the, the, the top of the list for me as well. Um, so it's, I'm very encouraged to hear you say that, um, you know, the state of late night is, is, is at least stabilizing as opposed to for years and years and years, it seemed to be, well, what the question mark. The appointment TV, that's a great point about sports too. Like like last week's, uh, and I'm not a huge NFL fan. I'm a Canadian, so hockey's religion up here. But 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 at the same time, even here, like the rating of of, of Sunday's football game, I think it was 56 million people watched that. And and the and, biggest, and I, biggest ever, the yeah. biggest number ever yeah. for a championship game. Yeah, the biggest ever. So I mean, there's something going on that with that. Yeah. Um, People will still watch that. People, it's it's something we do together. We used to watch television together. We used to do that. We used to all watch something, some things together. And the next day we would talk about it. And yep. that doesn't happen anymore. No. Very rarely does that happen. No. And I think that is a big loss culturally. That you don't you can't if you do see a show you like in streaming and you start to talk, I haven't seen it yet. I don't want I don't want I don't want to know what's going on. Yeah. You know, it, it's so different. It's just not. There's not an interaction like it, it's very, we've become very separate that way in yeah. our habits and what we watch and how we isolate ourselves and we stay on our phones and all that. And then when there is something that everybody's watching, 
you know, you you then all talk about it together. There's there's some link to that, and yep. I really I you know I I think there's great stuff that's happened because of streaming, but I I cannot accept that television's better now than it used to be. It's not better; it's different. It's separate. It's you know there, you have much more choice and all that. Although you don't really <laughs> the idea of avoiding commercials is going away. They're all going to put commercials on now, but. I mean, because yep. they're losing their shirts on the screen, but that's a whole other story. But it's yep. not, it, there's something diminished in the experience. And, and you know, if you watch, if you're, you're up late and you turn on Colbert or Fallon or Kimmel, it, it, there's something to that experience still, you know? Yes. I got to see, gotta see you, know, you know what Trump said today? I got to see this. I got to see what the jokes they make of us. You know, it, there's something to that. I, I hope it doesn't really get squashed by, you know, NBC or somebody going out of business because you know that could all happen if they don't it's very hard it's a it's become a really marginal business for the companies that own them companies that yeah. own them have you know uh, Disney almost sold ABC they were talking about selling ABC yep. you know so I, I can't guarantee that it'll go on forever but I I do think especially now you pointed out it's election year the profile is going to be raised again and and we'll see what happens yeah it's it's really interesting um I uh I appreciate very very much your perspective on this, and I, I want to be uh, I want to be honoring with your time because uh, I want to have you back on as many times as I possibly can. Um, would you, could we do? Uh, we've done this with a few different guests, Morty included, um, and uh, and it's always it's always fun. It seems to be something that uh, that the audience likes. Um, can we can we do a little bit of name association with you? I'll give it a go. I can't guarantee I'll know them all. But. No, 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 no. I, 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 it's 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 a softball list, Bill. Okay. Um, you'll know them all for sure. Um, what do you want to give one word answer? No, no, just a, a word, a sentence. Just first thing that kind of okay. pops into your mind. Um, Meryl Marco. Uh, absolutely brilliant, witty, uh, groundbreaking talent. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Amber Ruffin. Uh, really uh, rising talent. Uh, great appreciation for her. Uh, the SNL made a huge mistake when they didn't cast her. Totally. Uh, Rob Burnett. Rob Burnett? Mm -hmm. Did you say Rob Burnett? I did. Uh, so Rob, I've known Rob forever. Uh, very creative guy. Um, you know, important figure in the history of late night. Could not agree more. Steve O'Donnell. I never got to know Steve. Uh, I only know of his incredibly inventive comedy that, you know, really helped first Dave and then Conan. Really influential guy. Oh, he's a fantastic guy. Um, Jack Rollins. Jack Rollins, you know, manager for Dave. Yeah. Uh, probably uh, made, made a huge mistake in not guaranteeing that Dave got the Tonight Show. Big managerial mistake. Just let that set for a second. Uh, Tom Shales. Tom, I knew well. Very yeah. sorry to hear him passing. Yeah. Incredibly talented, uh, funny writer. Uh, was the only person to write a negative review of The Late Shift uh, <laughs> uh, because I, I think he really felt like he was the guy to be close to like Dave and stuff, but I got along well with him. I, I sort of felt like a, a total one of a kind sort of journalist. Yeah, very much so. Paul Schaefer. Paul's an amazing talent, amazingly talented musician and really underrated comedy guy. Really good, really dry, great delivery and hugely helpful to Dave. Uh, Dick Cavett. Dick, I've gotten to know a lot since uh, I, I've been doing this, and uh, thoughtful, d uh, great stories, really witty human being. I mean, very, very witty human being, and sort of an underrated uh, factor in late night because he was so in the shadow of Carson. But you know, he he put on a great show when he was on. He had the best guests imaginable at the time. He he had all the guests that were too young and hip for Johnny, you know. Mm hmm. And that's saying something. Um. And then that's when we go to Arsenio Hall. 
Arsenio Hall, again, a, a guy with great influence in late night. Um, you know, I, I think he did an amazing thing in taking on Carson. Uh, good example of a guy who really was a late night force and then hard to do anything else. Uh, you know, uh, but but he, while he was hot, he he really made an impact bringing in, you know, minorities, viewers. I mean, they didn't watch Carson much and he really carved out a niche there. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I I put Cavett and, and Arsenio beside each other because really uh, two of the only, uh, you know, if there was counter programming to Carson's Tonight Show, uh, there's two examples right there of, 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 of you know, and you, you mentioned it yourself. You had the people who were a little bit more hip than what yep. the Tonight Show was was putting out at the time. So, yep. Um, yep. and we'll finish off with a couple Uber producers. Uh, Robert Morton. I, I just love Morty. Um, fabulous character. Uh, and, you know, at, at the height of Letterman's fame, he was mm -hmm. really important. A, a guy who was in Dave's ear and did have influence on him. And, you know, it was I think he was, was an exceptional late night producer. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and then Barbara Gaines. Barbara's a, I love talking to Barbara. Uh, I, I, I admire her career. She totally comes up from nothing, uh, you know, and becomes very vital in, in, in late night and put together one of the great montages you will ever see uh, at the end of day's run. Yeah. That was one of the, that's uh, yeah. That, that final montage um, I want to have, uh, I, she won't, they won't do it, but I want to have her and Randy on um, Randy Grosick to literally go to talk about that montage. There's a guy who actually took that montage apart completely. Is that, and it's Adam uh, Nadef and he, he took it apart completely. I'm going to have him on the show. We're going to go kind of go through the montage and do a show on that. And then the the fact that they did um, there's a lot of story behind that montage uh, uh, the the fact that they're playing live music to a, a a canned piece of of video is is astounding the rehearsal went perfectly uh, the actual uh, you know last show didn't um, in the editing room you know there were people who missed the final party uh, that night chairs were thrown across the room because they were trying to put it all together that montage has a has a podcast episode to itself so I'm glad you mentioned that one of the greatest moments in television. Right. Um, and, 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 and Bill, I just can't tell you how much I appreciate Good. your contribution to this thing that we all love. You are, uh, you know, the ultimate compendium uh, to, 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 to late night. I just uh, appreciate everything that you're doing. Um, the last time you were on the show, the CNN deal was about to end in about, you know, six weeks or two months after uh, the CNN deal has ended. What are you doing these days? Um, uh, what can we look for? Is there anything that we can look for and, uh, how can we help? Yeah, I, CNN, I still do, uh, write occasion for their website. Um, um, and I've written for the times, uh, op -ed. and, uh, I have, uh, another uh, project that will be announced uh, within a couple of weeks. Um, and, Is it to uh, do with late night at all? It does have to do with late night. Um, and uh, that will be, I hope, uh, a focus for a while. Um, and uh, and I've done some other writing on my own, which I'm enjoying. Uh, so it's been nice. Uh, it's been a good experience. I, I worked a lot with Brian Stelter on his book uh, this past year. Um, he brought me in to just sort of help. He was, he was against a terrible deadline, and we worked well together. Stay on the fringes and uh, stay active and, you know, win, so. I feel like there's a more to come, um, and I'm very, very excited to hear what this announcement is. Uh, it's it's going to be it's going to be great. Uh, you have a standing invite so. here. I will bug you uh, every very respectfully, but to have you back on here, this is an absolute honor. Um, as always. And um, thank you very, very much for everything that you've done, Bill. I just, I can't thank you enough for it. Well, I, I enjoy that. Talking to you, Mike. Bring up things I've forgotten, which is nice. <laughs> Go uh, back. So, so well, uh, I want to say one last thing. With Conan yes, sir. Is, Please. Is another, he's another day figure for like for my son and at that age group. Conan was their guy and he made a tremendous mark. And uh, I just, like to mention that um also i wanted to send out a nice word to jay absolutely about... yeah um you know jay leno uh, you know, yes our thoughts uh with you 
Um, I've got a father who's actually starting to go through dementia and things like that uh, right now. So we want to send thoughts out to Jay Leno. Thank you for saying that. I meant to say it earlier. Uh, I also meant to bring up Conan too. When you talk about messing around with the format, there's a guy, his last shows, you know, changed it to the, changed his, uh, yeah, yeah. He changed everything. It's going to be very interesting to see what Conan brings out. Uh, it's, it's so encouraging to see his podcast empire growing the way it is, his deal with Sirius. Um, it's, it's cool to see, uh, yeah, we didn't even talk about Conan. God, we didn't even talk about Conan this episode. And you talk about a guy who's becoming, um, you know, a giant in his own way in a completely new direction. And that's Conan yep. O'Brien right now. So yeah, very, thank you for, thank you for mentioning that bill. That's, 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 that's fantastic. That's why you're the pro. Um, Thank you so much. Uh, this is why okay, we do the show. You, yeah, mm -hmm. no, no, no. I'll do a real quick outro and we'll say our goodbye privately. Um, okay. Okay, so we've mentioned Bill Carter maybe more than anybody else uh, on, on on this show. We're constantly referencing his, uh, his amazing works, uh, well-articulated, well-researched, uh, written beautifully. If you haven't uh, gotten The Late Shift, the digital platforms have a really cool new version of it with some extra material on it. Highly recommend the late shift, and then you got to get the war for late night. Um, the the war for late night was unbelievable uh, because it was like the late shift expanded with all these extra characters. You got to get those books; they're fantastic and really do have relevance as to what's happening today. They are, in many ways, more interesting reads now than they were back then, which is insane to say because back then, uh, you know compelling to say the least. Uh, that has been another episode of the Letterman. Oh, you know what? The Letterman podcast is one sponsor, one sponsor only. And that is hello-deli.com. Rupert may not have the Hello Deli anymore, but he does have hello-deli.com. The only way to get officially licensed late show with David Letterman merchandise is Rupert. The final gift that Dave gave to Rupert was that license. And what a beautiful gesture it was. Go to hello-deli.com. Get yourself a piece of late show merchandise uh packed with love by rupert and if you ask really nicely he may still add onions to that order hello dash delhi.com this has been another episode of the letterman podcast with mike chisholm coincidentally i am mike chisholm thank you and good night overcoat and underpants <laughs>